Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya So we're reading from Srimad Bhagavatam, second canto. Chapter 10, Srimad Bhagavatam is the answer to all questions. And this is text number 47. Chakalasya Kalpalakshana Vigraham Yata Purastad Vyakyasye Padman Kalpam Ato Srunu Srinu Arimanam Chakalasya Kalpalakshana Vigraham Yata Purustad Vyakyasye Padmam Kalpam Atosrinu Arimanam Chakalasya Kalpalakshana Vigraham Yata Pura Star Vyakyasye Padmam Kalpam Matos Renu Bodhimanam Chakalasha Bodhimanam Chakalasha Kalpalakshana Vigraham
Parimanam, measurement, cha, also, kalasya, of time, kalpa, a day of Brahma, lakshana, symptoms, vigraham, of form, yata, as much as, purastat, Thereafter, Vyakyasye shall be explained Padman by the name Padma, Kalpam, the duration of a day, Ato, thus, Srinu, just here. Those sections describing the different manifestations of time in the different types of kalpas. Translation, O King, I shall in due course explain the measurement of time in its gross and subtle features with the specific symptoms of each. But for the present, let me explain unto you the Padma kalpa. Hmm. The present duration of a kalpa of Brahma is called the Varaha kalpa or Sweta Varata Kalpa, because the incarnation of the Lord as Varaha took place during the creation of Brahma, who was born on the lotus coming out of the abdomen of Vishnu. Therefore, this Varaha Kalpa is also called Padma Kalpa, and this is testified by the Acharyas like Jiva Goswami, as well as Vishwanath Chakravarti Thakur, in pursuance of the first commentator, Swami Sridhar. So there is no contradiction between the Varaha and the Palma Kalpa of Brahma. Om Gyan Timiranda Sya Gyana Jana Salakaya Chaksun Militam Yena Tasmai Sri Gurve Namaha Nama Om Vishnu Vadaya Krishna Prasthaya Bhutale Shimakti Bhakti Vedanta Swami Tinamine Namaste Saraswati Deve Gaudavani Pucharine Nirvasesa Sunyavadi Pastyatya De Satarine Panchakopa Tarubhischa Kripa Sindhu Pevacha Paditanam Bhavane Vyo Vaishnave Vyo Namaho Namaha Jai Sri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda Sri Advaita Gadadara Srivasadi Gaur Bhakta Vrinda Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. So the original commentator on the Srimad Bhagavatam is Sridhar Swami. There was that one pastime where Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu was uh, approached by Balaba Acharya. And Balaba Acharya had written a commentary on Srimad Bhagavatam. And he was pretty much proud of what he had done. So he approached Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu knew he was a great scholar, but he had one problem. He was proud. And Mahaprabhu didn't like that. So he came to Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu and he said, I have written a commentary on the Srimad Bhagavatam that surpasses Sridhar Swami's commentary. <laughs> Mahaprabhu became quite pensive and a little bit angry think that anyone would even speak about surpassing the original commentary, commentator on Bhagavatam, Sridhar Swami. But Balabhachari actually was very intelligent, shastrically, and he has written many uh, statements, and he's also written a commentary on practically every chapter of Srimad Bhagavatam. But Mahaprabhu immediately responded by saying, one who does not follow, if the wife does not follow the husband, she's a prostitute. 
In other words, you're going here and there, but you don't really understand who actually is the real commentary, commentator. So here you can see it's actually verifiable that Jiva Goswami, although he is considered the greatest of all scholars in Vedic culture, along with Vishwanath Chakravarti Thakur, which has written a very extensive and detailed commentary on practically every verse in the Bhagavatam, they all agree that Sridhar Swami's commentator, commentation on this particular subject matter, that is the, the Padma Kalpa and the Varaha Kalpa are the same Kalpa. <laughs> now sometimes you see that there is a difference in the Acharya's understanding of certain statements in the scriptures. And then you sometimes think, well, which one is right? and which one is wrong. But to think like that means to not understand the principle of spiritual pr uh, knowledge, that one can see the same principle from different angles of vision. And both can be right, explaining the same thing, but in a slightly different way. <clears throat> and if one takes one side of an argument against another, Great, if two great souls are arguing over these points or trying to make a point out of a discussion, if one takes the side of one over the other, one becomes vanquished. <laughs> this is like in the Chaitanya Charitamrita. When Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu came into the house of Sri Advaita Charya, after he had taken sannyas, he was on his way to Jagannath Puri. <laughs> but he, when he was bathing in the what he thought was the Jamuna River, but it wasn't. It was the Ganga. And then uh, 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 Advaita Charya came along and uh, was rowing a boat. And Lord Caitanya said, Advaita, you're here in Vrindavan. And then Advaita said, well, wherever you are, it's Vrindavan. <laughs> but actually, this is Shantipur. <laughs> and the Lord was so, when we said, ecstasy on, uh, going on his way to Vrindavan, that he thought he had reached Vrindavan. And he thought he was bathing in the Jamuna, but it was actually the Ganga. So Dwaita came with some dry clothes and then took Mahaprabhu to his home and he cooked this grand feast, huge feast for Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. And what Mahaprabhu said, just give me a little simple vegetables, that's all. <laughs> and then Dwaita Charya said, well, you know, every day you eat 56 offerings and, and for this, this is just a morsel. So don't play any games with me. Pretty much that's what he said. <laughs> and Mahaprabhu did start to eat, but he said, give me another plate. And then he took a little bit from everything and, and ate that. And Nityananda was also there. And then uh, when he presented that same feast to Lord Nityananda, Lord Nityananda said, I've been fasting for three days and I've come here and now I have to fast again. <laughs> and so Dwaita responded, well, you're just a reject Paramahansa. <laughs> and so the, uh, Nityananda picked up some of the rice that was prepared and he threw it. <laughs> and some of the Morsels bounced up and hit a dwaita on the leg and stuck to his leg and he started dancing in ecstasy. And then they start going back and forth, arguing with each other. <laughs> and the comedy and they were but the argument was that they were in a transcendental mood of difference. But the transcendental move overshadows the difference. And it was like a play. To just to uh, 
inspire each other in in a mood of argument. <laughs> Sometimes that happens. We get into arguments, but it's not really an argument. It's just a way to uh, bring out more points of discussions. And there's no enmity. And it's not a matter of who's right or who's wrong. So here, the same point is being made, is that uh, one should follow the Acharya, but sometimes even there is differences. And we use the example of Vallabharacharya when he wanted to prove to Lord Chaitanya that his commentary on Bhagavatam was more authoritative than uh, Sridhar Swami. And the Lord just called him a prostitute. <laughs> And that's the last thing he said, and he wouldn't, didn't want to hear anything else. <laughs> but here, you can see that it's mentioned here that they follow very strictly Sridhar Swami. And Sridhar Swami, although he is the commentary on commentator, the original commentator, he's, his is to Dave, his Lord Nishringadev. He worships Lord Nishringadev as his main deity in worship, not Radha and Krishna. Although he'll glorify Radha and Krishna and also Sita Ram, Lakshman Hanuma, all of the Narayan manifestations of the Lord, still he is very much attached and in the mood of worshiping Lord Nisringadev. So we see that even great commentaries who uh, discuss the Bhagavatam and are expert at the Bhagavatam may have another a, a focus on a manifestation of the Narayan, Narayan feature of the Lord, which is not contrary to Krishna consciousness. Here we're hearing a little bit about the element of time, <laughs> uh, different manifestations of the time element. Recent, not recently, but many years ago, I came across a treatise, which was an, a very written, a long, very extensive, long written f uh, analysis of a seminar that was held in the world many, many years ago, and some of the greatest personalities who were expert in spiritual life and great scholars attended that. And the topic of the seminar was time. <laughs> what is time? <laughs> and of course, and even the Dalai Lama, he was also there, present, and he was considered to be the, the, the most exalted personality there. And everybody presented papers, some presented papers, some presented, um, you know, or, orations. But they were all speculating on what is the element of time. But Krishna says in the Bhagavad Gita, Mitra Sarva Saharasya Hum, I am time. <laughs> so time is actually Krishna, but in his call is impersonal, unmanifested form. And it's the principle that moves along the material energy. It's like it's mentioned in the Bhagavad Gita that there are five subject matters, and one of them is time. <laughs> what is time? Time is not that thing you have on your wrist called a watch. <laughs> That's a measurement of time. But time is actually completely different, different from that. Time is the impersonal energy of the Lord that has six features to it. It brings something about, it develops something, and that same object stays for some time, gradually dwindles, and then ultimately produces some byproducts and then dwindles and vanishes. So time is that feature that moves everything along. It's the main force in the material world. And nothing in the material world is, is constant because it's always being moved by the time element. Something that is desirable at one point in existence may also later become undesirable, the same thing, and vice versa. The time changes people's lives, time changes people's consciousness, time changes people's directions in life. Time changes everything and moves things along. And the ultimate principle is that time is actually death. <laughs> Krishna comes in the form of time for those who doubt his existence. It's like sometimes people say, oh, I, don't, I don't believe in God. <laughs> Would you believe in death? 
They can't deny that. And so death is, is actually Krishna in the form of time. And Prabhupada usually wants to make a point. So he said he comes and takes everything away. <laughs> People all of a sudden will be living a very uh, so-called happy life and then the time element will come in the form of some cataclysm and some catastrophe and everything is finished. But time for a devotee is different. For the non-devotee, it's a very fearful thing because they, they race against time in order to fulfill their material desires to become happy in this world. So it says for a materialist to actually fulfill their uh, desires in this world, they have to forget that death is actually a reality. Because if they think about death, they cannot f focus fully on their goal in life. So it says for the materialist, they should free. That's why when we sometimes we speak in our different seminars and to people on the outside, we mention the, de the men we mention death. They say, "Why you guys are so morbid? Why don't you speak about something you know that's really fun and jolly like?" <laughs> But <laughs> well, there was one one sadhu. He was from the Sri Sampradaya, and he made a statement. He said, "There's two things you should always r forget, and two things you should always remember." <laughs> and the things he mentioned, he says, "The two things you should always forget: you should forget all the bad things that people have done to you." <laughs> Otherwise, you carry this mood around, and you're never happy, thinking of either to get revenge, or you're unhappy because something happened to you that somebody did, or some situation did, and your mind is never peaceful. So forgive and go on, move on. Forget all the bad things, that so-called bad things. Sometimes some of the bad things are not actually bad, but they just appear to be that way. <laughs> And then the other thing is forget all the good things you did for others. <laughs> we want to be known as a good guy, right? Good girl. We, we help so many people. We give in charity. We're always there when somebody's in need. And we feel good about that. But that can lead to a kind of a pride. It does. It actually leads to pride. Then Krishna actually says that uh, I am the ability in all living entities. And whatever you can do is simply coming from me. So ultimately we understand that ultimately any, anything we can do that appears to be laudable or glorify is simply Krishna's mercy, that's all. Coming through that devotee, that because the devotee qualifies to receive that mercy, that's the good quality of the devotee, but ultimately, the result is coming by way of Krishna. Because <laughs> he gives the result. And so, two things you should always forget. And then the two things you should always remember. You should remember that death can happen at any moment. And always remember the holy name. These are the two things that is mentioned in, by this one sadhu. So what is death? Actually, there's no such thing. It's just an illusion. <laughs> death is just an idea that, that somebody has come up with, and we use it in order to uh, give some definition at the end of the body. But the end of the body is not the end of life. But for the materialist, they live for the body, and therefore the end of the body called death is the most fearful thing. The devotees don't live for the body, they live to develop their relationship with the Supreme Personality of God and in devotion. Therefore, the end of the body is just a stepping stone to a higher stage of consciousness or another realm of existence where they can either continue in the same way or if, they protect, if the devotee perfects their life in this life, and taktwa deham porn and jan money nineteen mum eighty go you go back home back to Godhead. So in that sense there is no there's no real and if you analyze it in a very, you know, simplified way, just like 
when the soul enters into the into the womb of the mother, mother, it fertilizes the embryo, and then the body starts to develop. Before then, the life is not there, and then when the father injects the life, then the womb develops, and then that is called life, and the body develops. So when the soul makes its presence in the body, then life begins. And when the soul leaves the body, that's the end of the, the body, but life continues on because the soul is eternal and full of knowledge and always joyful. So the soul has nothing to do with the idea of death because, as Krishna says in the Bhagavad Gita, na hanyate hanyamane sarire, that... Um, that the soul, the body dies, but the soul is eternal, immortal, primeval. So what, what relevance does that have for us in Krishna consciousness? The time element is very important because time is, is precious. We say time is very precious. How you use time will really determine the quality of life and the direction you go in life. So time is, therefore, to waste time, Prabhupada would say, to waste time, or Srila Bhakti Siddhanta Sarasati would say, money is valuable. You can get it, and you can lose it, or you can lessen it, and you can also increase it again. But time goes in one direction. So whatever time is left in this particular body that we have, is valuable in the sense that if we use it to become fully Krishna conscious, then that is the best use of time. And then when, when it's time to end this body, and which is inevitable for all living beings, and the thing is nobody knows when time, that time element will come. It can come at any time, and we see in the world it's like that. There was a, there was a situation that I was personally involved with, where we were preaching in uh, Mumbai, and one college there was a, it was a medical college. I think it was JJ Medical College in Mumbai, and uh, we were, we were doing programs on the campus for the students, and students were coming. We're having a regular program, and so it was building up really nicely. Jai Sri Sri Radha Gokulananda Ki Jai. And there was one young man who was coming regularly, and at one point he said to his friends, you know, this Krishna consciousness is nice, but I want to I want to graduate top of my class. I want to be the best in the whole school. So I'm not going to come to the programs anymore. I'm going to simply study. And so there was about three months left before graduation. He was in his final year. So he started and he just stopped coming. His friend said, well, all right, but come back after you're, you know. They didn't like the idea, but he was determined. So he went and he really worked hard and studied. And when he graduated, he was the top in the entire school. <laughs> He was um, the best of all students. He got all of the honors as a, the, the top graduate in his whole school. So now he's graduated, and just around that, right after graduation, there was a program at the at the uh, college. And his friend said to him, "Well, how about you know? You said you're going to come back. Now you graduated. You've, you've accomplished your goal. Come back." He said, "Well, you know." There's a party tonight. I want to go to the party. So they tried to dissuade him, but he wasn't dissuadable. So he went to the party, uh, and he was dancing, and he had a heart attack and died on the dance floor <laughs> that same night. The boy was 23 years old, and he had no medical history of any health problems. And he was top in the medical school. So when his friends uh, heard about his situation, they became really serious. <laughs> and uh, because everyone thinks, well, I'm young. <laughs> you know, I got a long time to go. 
Yeah, that's generally the case. But the material energy works in such a way that nobody knows exactly. But if you take shelter of Krishna, of course, Krishna can, will do whatever he can to allow you to fulfill the desire of becoming fully Krishna conscious. And then you can go back home, back to Godhead. But if you waste time and you deviate and you just, and Krishna might smash you just to help you wake up a little bit. So don't waste time. Time is very precious. So it says for a devotee, a devotee looks, always remembers that death can happen every minute because that helps them to become more aware of the time element and then using every possible moment to f fulfill the real goal of like, life is to go back home, back to God, and develop love for the Supreme Personality of Godhead. So time is very pre precious. Srila Prabhupada sometimes would be giving a class, Srimad Bhagavatam class, to all those devotees. He did this a few times. He'd stop the class and he said, now it's 7.24 on December 15th, 1974, and then he'd stop the class, and he'd, then after one minute he said, now it's 7.25, the same day, where is that one minute? You may be a crorepati, <laughs> you may have so much money and wealth, you cannot buy back that minute. <laughs> so. He was making that point how valuable each moment is in time, and it is, because human life is very rare, and to get that opportunity to have human life means an opportunity to make all problems, and then go back home, back to Godhead. So time is there, and time is very powerful. Time is, in, time is relative to your consciousness, too. When you're having a good time, Hey, where did the time go? And if you're feeling unhappy, oh boy, the clock's not moving. <laughs> yeah, if, and if you wait, oh boy, it start, the clock stops. <laughs> so you, you, you perceive how time impacts upon your understanding based on the consciousness you have. So if you're engaged nicely in devotional service, you'll see time will move fast because you're actually enjoying life. When you're unhappy, time goes slow. If you wait, time stops. <laughs> it's the perception of time based on the element of consciousness. But there's another statement that if, you're, if, you, if you love, then there's no more time. Because love supersedes time completely. So we develop our love for Krishna, we develop our love for the devotees, and as that love manifests, then the time element pretty much takes a back seat in life. It's there, but it has no effect. <laughs> and so time is a very mysterious thing, and Krishna speaks about it in the Bhagavad Gita a lot. And Prabhupada means so use time in the best possible way. And what is the best possible way to use time is to chant Hare Krishna. <laughs> Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare. Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama. But if I'm chanting Hare Krishna, I'm not getting anything done. I got to get things done. If I get things done, then I have fun. Right? Because life means getting things done. Planning and doing and completing and then going on to the next thing, yeah. And I can see how many things I did in life and that's the indication of my success in life, right? <laughs> but actually that's the mood of the materialist. The, it's actually the element of the, pa the mode of passion. That success in life is getting things done, right? <laughs> But it's not about that. It's about living life in such a way that we can experience our relationship with Krishna. So it says, just as this is from the material perspective, 
that those in the mode of ignorance, which is the lowest of all modes, is that they think if I can do so, if I can get something, then I can do something, and then I can be something. So the mode of ignorance is, let me get something. The mode of passion is different. It says, if I can do something, then I can get something, then I can be something. And the mode of goodness is, if I can be something, then I can do something, and I can get something. See how the modes actually switch things around. But if a devotee doesn't care about getting anything except the opportunity for devotional service. So that is the greatest achievement, to have the opportunity for service. So by using our time and engaging in devotion, yeah, but we have so many things. I have a family and I want to get my, complete my education. And my friend just came from India and he wants to l learn about London, so I have to show him about Big Ben and the Ta Thames River and so many other things. We have to go on tour of London because he's a new guy in this place. You know, there's so many things that we are somehow diverted away from Krishna consciousness. But use your time wisely because it's very important because time is actually Krishna. And when we use time to serve Krishna nicely and chant the holy name, associate with devotees, or practice any of the aspects of devotional service, time becomes the friend of the devotee. For the materialists, it's the, it's, it's the greatest fear that time is passing and I'm getting older. <laughs> but a devotee, actually a devotee likes to get old because <laughs> it gets better. <laughs> Can the materialist thank you? Let's be young, let's live forever. And this is where the, the fun in life is. When you get old, you, you get kind of like weird, you know? <laughs> and you know, you can't do half the things you do when you're young, and it's, you need so much support and all like that. Yeah, but Prahlad Maharaj has a different idea on this. <laughs> He says, old means just before you die, and nobody knows we're going to die. So the, act, the, uh, the idea of young and old is just rel relative to a, a feature of material existence. For a devotee, devotee is always young. Why? Because they are always connected with the ever youthful Supreme Personality of Godhead. So even if they're old by material standards, they feel young. Why? Because they're connected to Krishna. <laughs> That, that feeling of young means that they, they don't really pay much attention to the age factor because it's just relative to the body. <clears throat> They're always engaged in devotional service and therefore they feel happy at any, t at any stage. Okay, so here's, these are a few points about the time element. Any comments or questions? Yes, Prabhu. Jai Krishna? Yes, very well. Thank you. About Vallabhacharya? Hare Krishna. Uh, the point about Vallabhacharya being scolded by Lord Chaitanya, but we also know that Vallabhacharya was Sukadeva Goswami and he also had personal darshan of Krishna. He, we also know that he is. Sukadeva Goswami? Vallabhacharya is? That's what I've kind of um, heard. I don't know if anyone can qualify that or not. Mm. Well, I don't. I can't dispute that because I don't really know. <laughs> but uh, ultimately, Lord Chaitanya was trying to. I mean, he's a great soul. There's no question about it. And you know, he's the head of the Pushti Mark, <laughs> and uh, which is in the in the sampradaya that pretty much is worships Bal Krishna, <laughs> Krishna as a baby. And but Lord Chaitanya wanted to didn't didn't like the idea of being proud, because even if you have a lot of knowledge and have a lot of abilities, as soon as pride comes in, it it pollutes the whole thing. 
um, pride, when one is proud, one cannot really feelingly approach the Supreme Lord. So he was very knowledgeable, and he had come up with many creative philosophical ideas, just like he came to Lord Chaitanya and he said, uh, I have uh, written, uh, I have written down all of the name, many of the names of Krishna. Would you like me to read them to you? And Lord Chaitanya said, I only know two names, Yasoda Nandana and Shama Sundar, that's all I know. <laughs> so he, the Lord Chaitanya wouldn't give him any, any, any. And then he came another time and he said, uh, he said, you know, we are, we are the wives of Krishna. And why should we chant the holy name, Krishna's name? Because he is our husband and the wife should not speak the name of the husband. That's what he said to Lord Chaitanya. And Lord Chaitanya said, yes, that is correct. But if the husband says to the wife, you know, speak my name, she has to listen. <laughs> So he shot down all of his arguments. <laughs> Every time he came, he wanted to prove something to Lord Chaitanya, that he had great knowledge of something. And Lord Chaitanya didn't like that attitude. <laughs> so, and then, of course, he came to Gadadhar Pandit, and Gadadhar Pandit is very mild and simple. And he ran up to Gadadhar, sat next to him, opened up the Bhagavatam, and started reading real fast to Gadadhar. And Gadadhar was thinking, oh, my God. Lord Chaitanya he knows that I'm listening to Vallabhacharya. He's going to be unhappy. But but Gadadhar's mood is that he's so mild, and so he couldn't say he couldn't do anything because he felt he might offend this great soul. So he sat there while he was supposedly speaking. Gadadhar was praying, "My dear Lord, I don't really want to be here listening to this, but I don't want to offend him also." And then Subdhamadar found out about later and came, told Lord Chaitanya about it. Subdhamadar was not happy about that, that Gadadhar listened to Vallabhacharya. But Lord Chaitanya knew the mind of Gadadhar, so he didn't really, he didn't say anything to him in a, in a very, in a chastising way. But uh, yeah, so this, these are some, some of the pastimes. So obviously he is a great soul, there's no question about that. But even great souls sometimes get afflicted by pride. And that, that's the last snare of Maya. They do so many wonderful things to spread Krishna consciousness. They open temples, write books, inspire others to, to come to. But if they get a little proud, then that ruins everything. One has to understand that uh, everything Krishna says that Rasoham uh, Apsakuntaya. Uh, Prabhasmi Sasi Surya, Pranava Sarva Sabdike Purusham Nishu. The last line means, I am the ability in all living beings. So one has to be aware that whatever we can do, or whatever we, even the ideas that we create, ultimately everything is coming from Krishna. He says, Sarvashi Chahamridi Sani Vesto Matat Smirta Jnanam Apoanam Cha. I give you remembrance, I give you knowledge. I also give you forgetfulness. So the devotee gives honor to his spiritual master for any accomplishments he makes, or even to the Lord of the spiritual master. The devotee never takes credit for anything, because he knows it is the mercy of the Lord that is m making everything wonderful. <laughs> Thank you. Was the dimple? <laughs> Hare Krishna, thank you, Maharaj. Um, you mentioned we should try and forget any perceived bad things that's happened to us. Yeah. We should forget any perceived bad things and at the same time forget any good we've done for anyone. But that's how, the, yeah, how we can forget? forget the bad things, but we can't forget about how good we are, you know. <laughs> that's a tough one. <laughs> so what to do? Well, how, how do we forget the bad things? Yeah. Well, things that are that make you feel unhappy or unpleasant. Something that somebody did or something that somebody said and it was directed at you. 
And you may not be happy about that, or you might feel a little bit uh, like even like you want to retaliate. <laughs> Yeah, so this is a, you know, this is a seminar to discuss how to develop tolerance and forgiveness. It's not something we can just say you do and go on. It requires much understanding of these terms and in the dynamics that they play itself out. In other words, what is the situation? Who are the people involved? And so, not everything, you can't use just general definitions. But we do, sometimes, just to make a point. And then when it comes to the situation, then we have to understand it in more detail. Because sometimes to respond back to a situation that is unpleasant is beneficial. <laughs> and sometimes it's not. <laughs> Especially if there's other people involved. <laughs> it takes a little bit of understanding the situation in light of the principles that we're trying to practice. It's like we say, some people say forgive and forget. But we don't say that. We say forgive but don't forget. Because that means you might find yourself in the same situation again. <laughs> so be careful that, it, that, that by, by your for, forget, forgetting, you might also find yourself in that same awkward situation again. So there's just three, three alternatives. You forgive and forget, forgive and don't forget, and then approach the person and discuss it in a very... Uh, you know, uh, gentlemanly way <laughs> with respect to the situation. So there's pretty much those three, th uh, three options you have. Yes, okay. Okay, we... Shekhar, Nritya Shekhar. Hi, Krishna Maharaj. Um, thank you so much for your class. Um, earlier on, you spoke about um, how uh, seemingly acharyas might have uh, a different dif a difference by a detail, but they remain with the same principle. Um, my question is, from the perspective of a disciple, is it wrong to hold a different perspective um, on maybe a particular point from our spiritual master and still be submissive unto them and serve them? Or do we, if let's say there's like a difference in viewpoint or perspective? Um, when it comes to the spiritual master, I think it's, you should align yourself with that and then therefore clarify if there is a different perspective. Because he's making a point and maybe you're seeing the same point from a different angle, so there will be a different perspective. You have to understand why he's saying what he's saying and therefore how it applies, and if it applies to you or it just applies in general. Yeah. Because a lot of times we speak, but we don't explain, we just speak. And we wait for people to respond, either by questions or ultimately by actions. <coughs> so like we give a class, and we don't always explain everything we say. But that's why the questions and answers are there, to open up to the, the things that may need clarification. Like that. We have to go to the ladies. We'll come back to you next. <laughs> okay. Yes, Mother G. Thank you, really, for your class. Uh, nice and loud. Oh, you were mentioning that... Um, about time, something about time. Mm -hmm. So, and you were mentioning that time is like sort of in some impersonal dimension. Um, but I, I wanted to ask a question for me to understand it. It's, it's been like confusing for me for quite some time. You know, when we read Shastra, and then it says in the Shastra that time is eternal. 
But yet, time just exists in the material world. How do, how do I understand that? I that mean, time is eternal? Yeah. Well, the, element, the manifestations of the creations are temporary, but the, but the, the creation is eternal. So there is, there is creation, there is duration, then there is annihilation, there is an interim period, then creation again manifests after a certain period. So, and this is mentioned that the material world is eternal, but not each of the manifestations, they're temporary. It's Bhuta Bhuta Paliyate, it's created and destroyed continuously. So creation, duration, destruction, interim, and then again creation. In that way, in yeah. So that'll keep going on as long as there are conditioned souls. The material energy will, will still be here. Thank you. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Yes. Mm -hmm. I would like you to uh, ask three practical questions, please, if you allow to me. Three? Yeah. Okay. So one is, when I am late sometimes, is it an offense to Krishna's energy? Late for what? For meeting, for example, for class, for we have appointment and I'm late. Sometimes I'm late. So. <coughs> When the devotees were supposed to meet Indira Gandhi, they made an appointment with her. And it got, took them a long time to get this appointment with Indira Gandhi. And they came for the appointment, they came a half hour late. And she wouldn't take them. They missed the whole appointment. I told Srila Prabhupada, he was quite upset. He said, when it comes to important people, you cannot be late. Okay. And Krishna is very important. <laughs> so don't be late. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Um, <clears throat> thinking the second question is, uh, does Krishna uh, would, would like us to make things fast? Like if we have some project, we can do it immediately, you know, for him, like start to rush a little bit. Well, it depends on the project. Something, there's a thing called acting in a timely manner. That sometimes something is not meant to happen at that time, but it's still meant to happen in due course of time. So that you have to evaluate. Is it the right time to push this through? Or do I have to wait? Or do I move slowly? Or do I move quickly? You have, all of these are considerations when you do something. Yeah. Time, place, and circumstances. Yeah, yeah, it is, it's called, a, uh, just like a devotee may want to preach, but they're, somehow they're not qualified to preach, but they still can preach in the sense that they'll qualify themselves, and when they become more qualified, then they can preach. That's just a rough example. In other words, things don't always manifest at the time you want them. But they, but they still. It doesn't mean because they have it, they're not, they're not ready to happen now. They shouldn't happen at all. That you have to determine whether it's something that you have, want to work on and then develop it. <coughs> Just like Prabhupada would say, he would give the example. Very prominent. Says a woman, she gets married, and now she has a husband. Then she thinks, where's the child? Well, everything's in place, and the child will come in due course of time, so it takes some patience. <laughs> it's not going to happen immediately. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. The last question about um, when I start to remember in the, the death is near. The what? Death is close, very close. It's and always there. Yeah, yeah. I start to rush, you know. I start to like uh, to make some project. Trying to get things done, yeah. Yes, yes, trying to get things done. And there is some involvement of uh, other persons, like devotees, and they feel, feel all right. <laughs> I mean, they start to push sometimes, you know. And, um, and it, 
uh, it may become some not not offense but a little bit you no know, well you have to you have to uh, avoid a mode of passion just to get things done because when you're doing when you do that you sometimes you uh, you lose the quality of what you're doing just like this morning <clears throat> I uh, before I started my japa, I read one quote from Srila Prabhupada. And Prabhupada said, when you chant the holy names, chant nicely, clearly, sound the words and hear them carefully. Do not rush. Don't try to go fast. So that helped me a lot. And then I just, um, I was thinking I had so much time for chanting. I was thinking I may have to get so many rounds done because I won't have time later. But then I, when I, after reading this, it changed my whole approach. And I was thinking I should just try to chant nicely, don't worry about the time, whatever I can get done in the time that's allotted, that's fine. So you can, we can also work in that way. The idea is to stay, stay focused on what you're doing. If you rush, sometimes you you lose the focus. Or sometimes you forget things that you're supposed to do. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. If anybody has to go, it's fine. But we have one more question here. Thank you, Maharaj. You, I really like the, the points about the time. And one thing you said is that love supersedes the time. Can you maybe elaborate on this? Yeah, when you're in love, there's no time. <laughs> Try it out. <laughs> it's a fact. That's a reality. <laughs> time freezes or something like that. It's something I can't really break down any farther. You just have to experience it yourself. <laughs> Okay, it's just the nature of time, how it works. When you're in that consciousness, that's all. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Hare Krishna. Srila Prabhupada and Kijai. Hare Krishna. <laughs>